All right. Thank you for attending this session, all 24 of you. Um, I'm going to do an introduction. I'm Konstantin Stanka from Horton Ors. I'm a solution engineer. This is my buddy, uh, Jim Hughes. He's a mathematician for CCRI, also a GeoMISA contributor. Uh, and I'm going to start to do a syntactic analysis of our, uh, let's say, presentation title and say high performance and scalable and cloud and link them together, um, geospatial analytics and open source. And I have a few questions for you. How many of you today you do geoanalytics or uh, implement geoanalytics your, in your enterprise? All right. How many of you you do that with uh, big data? How many of do you do that entirely with open source? Okay, less and less and less. Um, how many of you you feel like you lose today geospatial valuable data that you could actually use to derive insights because you don't manage that through the big data. Good to know. That's our goal today, to show you that you actually can do this geospatial analytics on cloud with low cost storage, with burst of resources compute such that you can take advantage of the cloud for what the cloud is very good, and also with open source. This is all about open source, you know that. I'm going to take you from this, through this journey, and we also have a demo. Like, we like demos. Burn us. Remember the, demo, uh, the, the demos yesterday? If we succeed, give us a round of applause. If we don't succeed, give us a thumb down. <laughs> and For anyone doing the latter, uh, you can be in the hallway while you do it. <laughs> uh, if you dealt with this problem, I'm going to do a summary of what we will be presenting today. But one of the challenges is always to ingest your geospatial data, uh, especially uh, with the new sources of the geospatial data. In the traditional way, you know, you did not have that many sources, but today everything is mobile devices, IoT, all kinds of use cases that you can derive from that. But it's very challenging, and especially in the big data stack, uh, there are no uh, uh, data types. Uh, you have problems with storing geometry, and most, most of you probably you deal with, uh, you know, you still use maybe Esri products or you use the Oracle GIS capabilities or, uh, I don't know, uh, NetEases for, for that to do some uh, geospatial analytics. So you have the spatial capabilities or SQL Server. And that's a challenge that I have, you know, with all my partners this, uh, in crime doing geospatial analytics, too expensive, too little. They cannot store all the data. As such, they cannot derive a lot of insights, and it's not all about mapping, and that's what we're trying to demonstrate here. You, you infer a lot of intelligence from information that you would think is never going to give you an insight from spatial data, and he's going to demonstrate how we can actually discover, discover a manipulation of oil price, or how you can detect actually crime from geospatial. We'll do it probably some other time with the crime, but today we'll do the oil price. Uh, GeoMISA, NIFI, and Spark, and probably you're, you all of you use those in one way or another, will help you to ingest the data and store it such that it is effectively accessed. Uh, CloudBreak, you probably went through other sessions. You could build your own blueprint, or you can use one of our blueprints where you can actually deploy an ephemeral cluster with GeoMISA, Spark, and NIFI already. And you, you are in business of geoanalytics. It can be an ephemeral cluster. You can use uh, uh, object stores like S3 or WASP or other choices to, to decouple your storage from compute. And in the end, we want to show you this real-time uh, demonstration. This is actually real data extract, uh, received from satellite. Um, and let me go through the picture of today. This is the picture of today. Uh, you have a lot of data movement, and these are, these are sources and systems that have geospatial or non-geospatial data. Extreme complexity there. Duplication of data. Uh, you are unable to process the data in a single store. As, as such, you start duplicating the data. You create all kinds of data marts for geospatial. Uh, you do some analytics, eventually you pass them may maybe to Esri or Intergraph or some other capability that you have there to, to do more with it. Um, you have all kinds of technologies. And that was not enough 
for geospatial, you already got a big data problem, more and more uh, uh, geospatial data. Uh, if that was not enough, you already deal with the complexity of the spatial data types. It's about points, lines, polygons, all kinds of representations. And when you start actually uh, building your use cases, you start doing intersections of uh, points with lines, lines with lines, polygons with lines, trying to figure out where is the closest gas station or what, are, what is the area that I'm the most interested to find the house of my dreams or what is route optimization? How can I get from A to B? Or what am I supposed to do if, uh, let's say, birds are migrating from Canada to Mexico and I have uh, Delta Airlines flights uh, which might actually intersect those uh, birds. Uh, you don't want to uh, kill the birds, but you also don't want to kill your pas passengers. That you do with the relations. Am I in the proximity? Am I intersecting a region of risk? Am I overlapping? Am I in a, uh, at the boundary with something? Geometry one and one like we did in school. And that's not enough. This gets even more complicated than the data scientist folks and the mathematicians can actually tell you that. You start implementing all kinds of algorithms that, you know, probably you have them out of box with Spark, or you can implement them with your uh, choice of uh, R or uh, SAS or SPSS or, uh, you know, statistic, mathematics. Uh, this becomes even more complicated, especially in the conditions of the big data. Imagine tens or hundreds of terabytes of data and start implementing these things. You need really the compute capacity to scale for a specific problem when you need that compute capacity. And when you don't need it, you need to destroy that compute capacity. You don't want to spend for it. Uh, if we infer the requirements for building such system, you would think, you know, in the traditional approach, if you probably did this, uh, you get the data from somewhere, you have to clean it, you have to upload it. It's a lot of uh, three months, six months, nine, nine months project. Uh, then maintaining that, then shipping the data back and forth, uh, you know, begging for resources and so on. Uh, hopefully, uh, with cloud, the only thing you're begging is to have some uh, funds on your credit card. And Again, the requirements are different for what was 20 years ago or 10 years ago today. Again, you guys right now taking pictures, you know that those are, uh, have a location. I actually can place you right now in the second row or you in the fifth row and being in proximity. You guys might have met before, but you don't know. But if, we, if you have that information, you, you, you might actually say, oh, when you see those things, there is a friend in a radius of uh, five meters or someone that I met at a different conference, another use case, or, you know what, this is a bank, this is a lake, and I'm looking for a bank of fish. Uh, and I have a preference for some fish, and there is some indication there is a bank of that fish type in the proximity of my boat. Now, should I, you know, start chasing and looking for fish, or I have some intelligence that tells me that that fish bank can actually move with a speed of three miles per hour, and they usually move where the water is actually uh, cooler or deeper based on the characteristic of that uh, fish. All kinds of use cases that you, you, you can imagine and you can uh, improve your business. Uh, sensors everywhere. Uh, as I said before, the data layer has to scale and has to be also low cost. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, use cases implemented again with object stores, very cheap, spin a cluster, process the data, uh, squeeze the, the juice there, put it back maybe in another bucket of data and use it uh, for, to train your models, build your models and implement it in your maybe real time analytics. Analysis has to be easy. It doesn't have to be complicated, or even access to the data has to be easy. Everybody likes SQL, no matter what. It was invented tens of years ago. I think it's still going to be around for tens of years. Even it might get different specifics. Even if we do know SQL, you will still have a place for SQL. All right, the challenges we discussed about the big data problem, a lot of data, more and more data, uh, we, I don't think we uh, extract all the value of our data. We can actually improve our life so much and our businesses so much if we actually deep into the geospatial data and temporal data. A combination of temporal and geospatial together can give you so much difference in your use cases. 
we discuss about the cloud providing that, and it provides that in the most efficient way when you can decouple compute from storage. If you start you know, embedding compute and storage and you have to ingest 20 terabytes of data, 40 terabytes of data in order to run some HDP cluster there, uh, or H, uh, HDF uh, cluster with you know, tons of uh, uh, terabytes of data and Kafka topics, it gets a little bit complicated. Uh, from the maintenance point of view, even cost point of view. You want to be able to spin cluster for the data scientists, for example, to do some, uh, you know, pattern recognition or model something. They, they spin the cluster based on a blueprint, which uh, is specific for a workload. It has all the S3 buckets, let's say, already mapped as a configuration. They do it, they, uh, they, uh, they use it. Uh, time-based, it's killed, it's destroyed, very easy for them, they don't have to do anything, it's the red easy button. They use it for discovery, the data is already inferred in the cluster, if it is already stored in S3 bucket. Uh, visualization is very important, that's the way you sell. You sell to your business units, to your customers, internally. People like representations, like they understand for example, if you are in a collision course with uh, some birds or uh, very close to a fish bank, better than telling them, hey, see that fish bank is 33 yards northwest, two degrees, uh, 14 minutes and 25 seconds, okay? But if you show them the visualization and they actually can drill down in the visualization and they can apply filters, just show me this type of fish bank or just show me everything that is within uh, 50 yards. Or, you know, you imagine the way you put filters for other things, you, you can put filters for geospatial. Uh, I, I've seen cases where, let's say you wanna build a new store for your business, and, and you have all kinds of criteria. It has to be not further than from a road. It has to be not further than that from a gas line, from a power line. It has to be in an area that is underserved and has a market uh, demand for a specific uh, product and so on. How can you do that without, ge without the geo-analytics? Uh, I'm not going to bet it on cloud break. I, I'm sure you, if you are at this conference, you know the cloud break is your tool of choice to deploy your cluster for geo-analytics in your cloud of choice, whether it's Google or Azure or OpenStack and uh, AWS. Now I'm going to introduce my buddy here. He's the mathematician of this solution. If you want to know the internals, he's the guy. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for making it here after the afternoon coffee break. Uh, I'm Jim Hughes. I'm a committer with Location Tech, which is a working group of the Eclipse Foundation, which focuses on big geospatial uh, software solutions like Location Tech GeoMesa and Location Tech uh, GeoTrellis. There are a number of other projects there. Um, I've been working in open source uh, geospatial software for about four or five years now. So if you've got questions about how do I do something geospatial with uh, free software, I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, the technology that we're gonna talk about with GeoMesa is focused on vector data. That's points, lines, and polygons. If you've got raster data, that's usually a pretty picture or some sort of other uh, gridded-based observation about the world. Satellite imagery falls in that latter category. And there was already a talk about uh, understanding some of that data to uh, figure out land use coverages. OK, so now that we know what we're talking about, we're talking about points, lines, and polygons. GeoMesa, it started out as a way to uh, offer spatial temporal support on top of Accumulo, and from there it's built up a fair number of capabilities. The goal is to help us manage um, streaming data, persisting data, and also analyzing spatial temporal data at scale. And we'll take each one of these things one by one. So first, to talk about how we actually deal with streaming, we integrate, Kafka, integrate with Kafka and use Kafka to go ahead and have message uh, formats that we pass around on topics that describe how uh, sensor data is changing. In the demo, we'll be looking at data that's coming from a satellite-based AIS company, 
called Exact Earth. What happens is every time a boat moves a little bit, it broadcasts out to the world, says, hi, I'm here, here's my current status, here's who I am. If you've got that kind of data, you want to be able to see a live view of that, and that's what we use Kafka for. This also gives us a chance to integrate with Storm and provide geoanalytics like simple things like geofencing, you know, did someone drive a tractor and start heading for the, you know, outside of the county border that they should be operating it in? Or you could start to do other things like cleaning up a track and building up information about how, um, you know, an entity is moving through space and time. The project got started with answering the question of how do we store hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes of data in NoSQL databases like Accumulo. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically HBase uh, with a little better cell level security. We quickly wound up uh, implementing support for HBase and then later Cassandra. And as we've been looking at all these different possibilities, we've dug into some of the file formats like the Avro file format and Parquet to understand how we could go ahead and just write our data directly to those and use cloud native storage provided by all the vendors you're familiar with to go ahead and um, offer a vendor agnostic uh, way of going about things. And this gets to one of the points that Constantine made. We're always looking for ways to decouple our cost of analysis and our cost of storage so that we can uh, manage those separately. In terms of managing the data, this is where NiFi and things like uh, Hortonworks Dataflow come in. We've got NiFi processors that will help you go ahead and write whatever data you're working with straight to GMESA on HBase or straight to a Kafka topic. And by the time you put together a, a little bit more of a complete flow there, that can give you a great complete solution for managing how you're moving your data around even if it does have a geospatial flair to it. On the analysis side of things, um, as Constantine said, SQL is going to be with us forever. And I feel like part of the drama of big data is you go create a new thing, and it doesn't do SQL until you finally, like enough people ask, does it do SQL? And then you say, yes, it does. Here's We finally have that. Um, by integrating with Spark SQL, we can do that. And if you're you know, coming at it from a business intelligence side, there aren't necessarily um, spatial predicates for you already. And if you go ask uh, most of the other tools that do SQL, uh, they don't have, um, at least in the big data arena, they don't have uh, integration for points, lines, and polygons and ways to represent some of those uh, basic predicates like intersects and contains. We went ahead, and if, if there are folks who have more of a GIS background, you might be familiar with PostGIS. We implemented that kind of functionality in Spark SQL. In terms of managing how you're doing your analysis, uh, notebooks are a great way to prototype things. So uh, shout out to Jupyter and Zeppelin for those. Uh, the demo will, will run through a quick uh, Zeppelin notebook. OK, so if you need an obligatory uh, slide to show a Lambda architecture, here it is. Uh, going left to right, we can manage our ETL. One of the things that I haven't talked about is that GMESA has a converter library to help uh, get your data into you know, sort of the geospatial format that most of the other tools in the open source ecosystem around geospatial uses. And that's something called OGC uh, Simple Features. Once you've got it mapped there, if, you've, if you want to see what's happening on uh, a live view, that's where you can use Kafka and Storm to uh, stream data, analyze it, apply whatever those rules that you might you know, want to have with that live stream of data. Drop it out to a product called GeoServer. Um, this is the open source version of Arc Server, basically. On the you know, persistent side, we can go ahead and write to any of our uh, big data store uh, distributed uh, sources there and then do analysis with MapReduce and Spark and so on. Okay, so 
Now that we've talked about the fact that we do streaming, persistence, data management, and analysis, let's take each one in turn, dive a little bit deeper for a second about what it actually is we're doing for each of those. In terms of streaming data, what we're, this is really aimed at, I've got a thing moving through space and time, and I get updates about where it is. So it's really a CRUD operation where you say, you know, you go from your sensor saying, I'm here now, I'm here now, I'm here now, to saying, okay, update where the entity is. And so we've just got a live stream of those updates. Um, and you can do uh, complex event processing with that and have uh, some good, clean fun uh, seeing where things are right now. Did you have something? No. no. Cool. Okay. In terms of how we persist data, a lot of the databases we work with are key value stores, and those are really good at looking up a single record or doing a range scan. If you've got a query that is, give me all the data for a big bounding box, you need to be able to turn that into uh, a number of range queries in HBase or Accumulo. And um, if you haven't heard of people applying space filling curves to this, um, it's fun. I've got other talks where I go into more of the details. If you want to hear more about those details, uh, I am a mathematician. Uh, let's talk afterwards. Um, it's definitely like a fairly nerdy topic, especially when you realize that space filling curves can compose and they can be in whatever number of dimensions you want and so on. Okay, uh, to get to some of the more nitty gritty bits, we can do the fine grain filtering by using the server side programming that's available in HBase and available in Accumulo. Um, and that has some really uh, powerful capabilities that uh, maybe we'll touch on in the demo. We've also been looking at answering the question, could we ditch the database and just write data directly to uh, a file system like S3, a, you know, uh, a store like that. And that's where we've been playing around with and seeing what we can do with Orc and Parquet. Um, okay, um, in terms of data management, this is where um, Constantine spoke with my coworker, uh, Andrew, at a geospatial conference uh, about this uh, more in depth a month ago. Um, we integrate with NiFi to handle writing everything. So let's see. Uh, this is giving us a way to handle our management as we need to deal with data that's on premises, in the cloud, going back and forth between. And some of the important things is that we've got NiFi processors that write to each of the data stores that we want to write to. This also gives us a chance to um, integrate with and write to just any GeoTools enabled uh, data store. And a deeper dive into what GeoTools and GeoServer is is a little beyond the scope of this talk, so, but I'm happy to t answer questions about that. And here's a list of our processors. Like I was saying, we can drop stuff to Accumulo, HBase, the file system data store. Um, we've also worked a little bit with an Avro file format, and so that's where we can go ahead and, and uh, output uh, data in that format. Okay, let's talk about a little how we integrate with Spark and to uh, integrate things. And the first step that we need to do is we need to teach Spark about the geospatial types. Because if you don't know what a point line and polygon is, it's not gonna make sense to say, do you have an index that will you know, speed up my intersect query with a polygon? Uh, Spark offers um, some package private uh, interfaces there that we integrate with. And once we've got those types, we can define the functions and the Catalyst query optimizer gives some really powerful ways to plug into it to write rules where you can take your SQL query, push parts of it down to the database. As we write the output data back, we can put it in a way so that it's gonna be easy to interact with in uh, our visualization tools that we're working with. And this is where uh, working with a Zeppelin notebook is useful because you can go from writing PostGIS like uh, SQL to um, Scala, whatever else it is you need to uh, deal with there. 
All right. So uh, we're to our demo. If you can switch over to my laptop. All right. So as background, the data set that we're, all the data we're looking at at the moment is coming from a company called Exact Earth. They have um, sensors that are on the Iridium Next uh, satellite um, constellation, and every boat pretty much that's underway has to send out a little signal that says, I'm here now, here's my status, and those satellites can pick up that information, beam it back down, and we can move it around. Uh, that whole process is called AIS. It's the automation, uh, Automated Identification System, and it basically, if you're more familiar with an air domain, it's like ADSB. Um, the first thing that I want to look at is just a little of the data management. I mean, you're probably familiar with NiFi interface. Uh. Yeah. So the first thing that's happening is we're listening to a TCP port. As the data is coming in, we need to actually split it up and route it uh, because different messages come in uh, for the same thing. And yeah, we need to route on message type. And let me just go through a few of these. Um, we can use our uh, NiFi processor to write the data to Kafka. We'll see that as the live layer whenever we switch over to the little web UI we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of the demo. And um, those were headed to NiFi. As we're writing out some of the additional data, um, we need to put some data into Redis so that we can do enrichment because there are message types that come out of order where something will say the position updated or the status of a boat updated, and we need to sew those back together. Um, so, yeah. And here we're keeping some of the original input in S3 in case we need to uh, go through some of those details. Um, the things that I wanted to call out in particular, we're able to route messages around, we're able to uh, solve some of the out of order things that we would need to work through in the stream processing. We're able to keep an original copy and also get our data into GeoMesa. So let's look at um, um, a view of all the boats in the world. This is a UI that CCRI develops. It's called Stealth. And uh, we've got a you know dark background, uh, but all of the dots that we're looking at, that's some boat somewhere in the world. And so what we can do is pick anywhere. Um, does anyone have a favorite place that we should drill into? OK. Someone asked for New Orleans, so. Uh, all right. And what we can do is we can drill into the details of whichever boat we're looking at and start to understand um, what vessel type it is. Uh, there are things where we can find out if it's underway, uh, heading, and so on. Um, one of the other things, oops, let me turn off that layer. One of the other things we can do, and this is where our Lambda architecture comes in, is, and that didn't bring back enough results, that was gonna be boring. Um, once we've picked a boat, we can uh, make a separate query that will pull back all of the results for where that uh, boat has been. So I went to New Orleans. I didn't pay anyone $5 ahead of time uh, to specify the boat. And we can see that we've got a boat here that over the last, um, this calendar year, has just been making a little loop, it looks like, uh, around here, and we can actually animate this. Let me turn off the live layer. We can actually go ahead and animate this and see, um, you know, see this little boat. Yeah, we can see this little boat play the snake game and run through uh, whatever trajectory it's got. Um, this goes ahead and gives us a pretty powerful way to start to understand uh, what a vessel's doing or what a group of vessels is doing. Um, as an example of that, 
Um, I mentioned a second ago that all of this data is coming off of uh, satellites, and I've, I went ahead and loaded up um, almost two million records uh, in one of our uh, binary formats that we build up, and we've got data from all over the world. One of the really cool things we can do to it is by using the arrow file format, we can start to drill into it um, in browser and start to color by different uh, things. In particular, the thing that I want to color by real quick is the region ID. And the region ID corresponds to which satellite actually collected the data. And let me hit a button or two here. While you do that, again, the, the challenge here is to do this over big data with open source. Other problems like this obviously can be resolved in the traditional way with commercial products as, as they've been before. Yeah, so the fun thing here is you get this kind of disco ball <laughs> sort of view. And this is where I want to call out the visualization tools here. If you can't see your data, especially if it's got a spatial extent, you lose. You lose some sort of understanding. Because once you see this, you're like, OK, yeah, I, I can understand that there's a satellite that collected this, and it's moving around. And there are other patterns that if someone said, hey, can I write an analytic to do x, y, and z? The answer might be yes. It might be worthless. Um, if you can visualize it, it can drive a lot of your development a lot more efficiently. Yeah. All right. <coughs> so let me run through a little bit of analysis that we can do with uh, Zeppelin Notebook here. Um, I mentioned there is a file system data store. I went ahead and um, this is running on a really tiny cluster. I've run all the notebooks. Uh, it's a, cl a cluster I spun up in 10 minutes earlier today. Um, let's just bang through this real quick and take some questions. Um, the first thing that happens is if you're familiar with Spark, we need to have a spark.read command. Here we tell it the format's GeoMesa. That gets data out of S3 once we you know, give a few options. Um, we can go ahead and write SQL that will um, uh, create tables. OK, so that's creating a table. Do, 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 do. As we you know, run through uh, this analysis, is based around the month that Harvey came through the Gulf of Mexico. That gives us a chance to understand how uh, counts of vessels changed. And so that's uh, one of the things we're looking at here. So we can look at the number of tankers uh, that were around uh, during this month. And Zeppelin gives us a nice view of that. And the other thing that we've done is we picked on a place where the hurricane uh, had a big impact. That was around Houston, Texas. And we can see that right as the hurricane's coming through that a lot of boats got out of Dodge. OK. The other thing that this analysis uh, let us do, and admittedly, this is naive, so no one uh, should go out and like start making financial investments based off of anything you're about to see. Um, but we said, hey, if all these boats stop operating, some of them had gas, maybe that affected the gas prices. And we go ahead and pull that in from, uh, pull in various gas prices from uh, government sites. And now we can start to plot that. And I'm going to hit the uh, pedal here so we've got time for a few more questions. Yeah, and the plot here was, you know, again, naively saying that the plot was, why those oil tanks are full and they do not deliver the oil while people are actually yeah. impacting and need that? Like how they manipulate the, the oil market. And, and you can imagine this is derived intelligence from understanding not only the location, uh, X and Y, for those, but also the depth of those tanks in the water. Oh, yeah. That, that was another analysis that we did because uh, how high a boat is in the water is something that it reports. And if it's a gas tanker, exactly. You can figure out how full it is. And as we've looked around, you can just look at the data and see that there are 40 tankers parked outside of some ports. 
Yeah, and they will not deliver the gas until yep. the gas will reach a point of need. Yep. So the cool thing is, um, just to look at a little more of my coworker's notebook here, we can see that we've got uh, a pretty complex SQL statement where we're trying to build up and see what sort of uh, lag or comparison there is between the amount of gas uh, tankers moving around and uh, the change in the price. And now we can start to see that the ships dropped off right as the hurricane is predicted to come through. And it's you know two or three days later, we can see the price of gas is going up. Um, again, this is naive. Uh, one of the other things that uh, was likely a big impact here is that the um, storm also shut down uh, and flooded some of the refineries that were in the area. So, um, but this is just a highlight uh, that we can do geospatial in the Zeppelin notebook. We can start to tie it in with other data sources and um, have some good clean fun. Um, with that, I think we should turn it over to questions. Can you speak to the microphone, please? Oh, sure. I, it's interesting, and um, I think from, you know, I'm with insurance, uh, yeah. business and commercial. Um, what about um, some thought given to the um, event, so like Hurricane Harvey, mm -hmm. and then the rising cost of raw materials in a given geospatial area with a lat long assignment and yep. analytics around that? We use ESRI, of course, um, but is there a play after ESRI? Is there, is that what you're trying to I can, articulate? Yeah, I can speak to that, actually. I dealt with insurance companies that will actually use geospatial analytics with ESRI or Intergraph, but they say we discard a lot of data that we could use actually to do our predictions in regard to insurance premiums for areas that will be likely hit by hurricanes or storms or tornadoes or, I don't know, flooding. I already see that use case already re be required today. Uh, they don't like the fact that they have a lot of data. Uh, uh, they have to actually put the data in S3. They started to build their own custom solutions involving, I don't know, storing the data somewhere else cheaper and using Spark, but they still have to move data back and forth between S3 and Spark and processing, and probably you can speak to that. But having the data in your data lake, you talk about these days having your data lake, and you don't have a place for your geospatial data today. If you think about you know, putting the data in HDFS or HBase or any, anything like that, or Hive, it's a, it's a challenge today. You still have to store it in data stores as, uh, as before. Definitely that's a use case that I have in mind right now, and I've seen that being required. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that you're using NiFi and Storm. So I'm just curious why you're using both, because they seem pretty similar to me in your architecture. Ah, uh, ah, uh, OK. So we adopted Storm first. And one of the primary use cases that I'll throw out there for Storm is imagine you've got your stream of boat data coming in. You actually want to, in some cases, put together a track that has that information in it, and you might need to be able to maintain um, that state of data. Uh, so if you're maintaining a track in a, you know, or other information about the entity that's changed, you can keep it in memory in a storm process. Doing that in NiFi would either uh, just flat out not work, or it would kind of be against the paradigm. Um, that said, I, I, things I learned at this conference, um, uh, seeing some of the like uh, SAM and SSM uh, technologies, I, I'm really interested to see what we can do there uh, that would let us kind of take things to the next level. And I can complete to that. There are some use cases where the low latency that Store provides, also the complex event processing capabilities that Store provides. NIFI is not meant for complex event processes. It is actually meant for simple event processing and yes, stream ETL. Those are the specific use cases. Why not just use Storm for everything then? I can't hear. Sorry. Why not just use Storm for everything in that case? Uh, if you try to do stream ETL with Storm programmatically and see what's the cost to do that, like conversions. Also, can Storm support uh, tens of different protocols, different type of formats easily? 
Can, can you do that with a low cost of development? That, that's probably one of the questions. That's why NIFI exists, to be able to implement uh, ingest from hundreds of different data stores over tens of different protocols, uh, being capable to do data conversion at lower cost of device. And one other thing, uh, as just to wrap us up, that I'll say about uh, Storm versus NiFi, the fact that NiFi's already got a ton of uh, capability is a great reason to use it. Anyhow, that's our time. Uh, we're happy to stick around and answer some more questions. Thanks.